Good afternoon. So I'm very happy and honored and actually quite excited to be here. I wanted to say that uh, lined up after lunch is probably as challenging as um, water scarcity, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm very happy to be here and uh, discuss water issues with Professor Meni Elimelech. But before um, I invite uh, Professor Elimelech to the lab, to the, um, on stage, I would like to say that uh, my name is Amit and I'm currently the uh, director of the Zuckerberg Institute uh, for Water Research here at the Boclair campus. And the uh, institute is a leading international multidisciplinary in institute um, which is dedicated to studying water in anthropogenic and natural environments and is a national uh, center of expertise providing critical training in water issues to tomorrow's uh, leaders and professionals. And I'm um, very proud to be part of this um, institute. As for my own research, I'll just say in a couple of words, I'm trying to uh, take what most people would consider uh, waste and uh, such as sludge and wastewater and convert it into a green resource uh, to say um, energy and um, nutrients. And as suggested, we are honored to have with us today Professor Menachem Elimelech of Yale University. And as of uh, last night, also uh, an honorary doctorate recipient from Ben Gurion University. So, mazal tov, many. <laughs> it's really an honor. Um, Professor Elimelech is a renowned expert in the field of environmental and chemical engineering. His invaluable contribution to this field have left an indelible mark on water research, desalination, and membrane technologies specifically, and um, to the planet as a whole. Professor Elimelech research focuses on processes and technologies at the uh, water and energy um, nexus. Um, and I would like to um, uh, join you on stage. So um, actually earlier this week, we were lucky enough to have uh, many, I hope it's okay to call you many. <laughs> um, uh, we we're lucky enough to have many uh, discussing water um, issues and water research with several of, of our excellent students who are in the audience. And uh, we would love to hear your impression and what your thoughts about this meeting. Indeed, I met with four PhD students. I mean, I found the research to be really exciting. They work on quite relevant topics to the Institute, and they use the most advanced uh, analytical tools really for their research. So I would like to say a few words about each one of them. And, and again, not only that they are doing some good research, but they also come from diverse backgrounds. And I will start to talk about each one of them in the order that I met them. It's not in any order of preference. So, the first one is Kia Abu Khadra. He is working with Professor Moshe Herzberg. Kia came to here from the city of Tulkarem in the West Bank. And it's not an easy thing to go there and to visit his family, you know, it's not easy. So Kia works on a technology that we call membrane bioreactor. Membrane bioreactor is a technology to treat wastewater in an advanced way. Most of you know that Israel recycled most of the wastewater here for agriculture. And you heard about the Shafdan, maybe you visited it here. They take all the wastewater from the metropolitan area of Tel Aviv. They treat it by some technologies that are maybe 50, 100 years old, but still working. And they put it in the groundwater and then pump it one kilometer there and then use it for agriculture. So this membrane bioreactor is really advanced technology that can replace some of these all, they call them sometimes Victorian technologies, really, and, and really put the, you can have the plants a much smaller footprint and you can expand the plant. So this is quite exciting and very relevant. The second student is uh, Tal Godlinger. Uh, she works with Professor Shire Non. 
And Tal was a master student here way back, and she went for industry, worked for about, not for industry, maybe government for five, six, seven, eight years, I don't recall exactly, and then came back for her PhD. So she works on monitoring the water quality of the Yarkon, we call it in Israel Yarkon River, but you know, it's like a stream. <laughs> and, and as you know, most of the stream in Israel, probably, I don't know the percentage, but at least half of them are treated wastewater. I'm sure you heard the story, I mean, in 1997, the Maccabea Games, a bridge fell and four athletes uh, fell, and one of them died not from the falling, but from the infection from the water. So she's really working on monitoring the water quality of the water, and hopefully with the uh, online monitoring, she can know at every second what's happening there, you know, she can find a way to alert about some contamination, and also, I mean, use this knowledge to uh, uh, re treat and recover some of the other streams in Israel, like the Kishon. You also heard about the Kishon, it's a really dirty one. So the, sir, the third student is uh, Hao uh, Wang, and he's from the city of Wuhan. You all know about Wuhan now from China. And, uh, and he works on advanced membrane technologies, again, uh, materials, how to make membranes to treat a variety of wastewater. Again, not only wastewater just for the Shafdan, but some wastewater that one day, and I will talk about it later, even to convert water, wastewater to, for drinking water. I will talk about it later. And don't worry, it's a really good water. I drank some of this water and it's an amazing one. So, and the last one is uh, Ben uh, Pudiak. And again, it's another interesting story. He went to undergrad at Georgia. His family met Aliyah. And he came here to work with Professor Osnat Gilor. He works on what we call microbial ecology of soils in the des desert. In a way, they use genetic tools and find what's the composition of bacteria that you have in the soil crust in the desert. And specifically, it works on bacteria that once it's raining, because of the rain, they start to proliferate, and then they release some organic contaminant that you smell. And this is what you call the smell after the rain. So anyway, their research is quite exciting. I mean, uh, you know, diverse topic, very relevant to the desert. And I was really privileged to meet with them. Mm. Yeah. Thanks, many. So diverse topic, diverse people, I guess, uh, <laughs> all different stories. Yeah, and it's of no secret that we are actually here in the middle of the desert. I assume that you all experienced it, not for the first time. And the question come to mind is whether, you know, studying water scarcity, studying water research in the desert, which is the environment where water is uh, in absence or lack, um, give, I would call it a competitive advantage, uh, you know, and looking at, for example, your, your groundbreaking research is in Yale, <laughs> not really a, a desert area, but what your thought about the, the, yeah. the actual place? I'm a strong believer for the, again, the location at the Institute. I, I, I was in the Scientific Advisory Board of the Institute since its establishment, I think, what was it, over 20 years ago? Time flies. Yeah. And again, so... So, so anyway, I think it's a unique institute. Uh, it's the only one, or if not, maybe a few in the world that really deal with uh, water issues for dry lands or deserts or arid regions. I think what's unique is also it's located in the desert. I, I'm not aware of many institutes that located in the de desert and work on such a wide array of water uh, issues. So it also, I mean, work on innovative solutions, then uh, desalination, wastewater reuse, uh, hydrology, microbial ecology, and all of them can be applied to other drylands, not only here in Israel. You can think about, I don't know, Southern California, Arizona, and many other regions. So, and I think what's importantly also, what importantly here that they work with the local stakeholders. They work with uh, farmers, uh, industry people, uh, policy makers, and this makes sure that your solution will be really applicable to the desert. So. I think it's a, I, I believe in this concept, and I think if you were not here, probably you will be working on some other topics. So it's good that you're here. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, you know, really, uh, the audience a little bit disturbing me um, here. I really wanted to know from you, um, you're not really disturbing me, <laughs> um, but I really uh, wanted to know or I'm um, 
very happy to know what would you think would be the, you know, the uh, future uh, research, water-related <laughs> research topics, let's say, in the next 10 or 15 years. And I'm asking that, uh, you know, because it's really a help. I would know where to go, maybe. Yeah. Again, it's a, what do you say, the million dollar, uh, 10 million dollar questions. <laughs> but I think, again, what's needed in Israel, what you're doing, I will say the advanced wastewater reuse. And again, I can imagine a wastewater reuse that you can tailor, find technologies that you can tailor, tailor it for any water need. Now what you're doing, you treat it by these Victorian technologies and use it for agriculture. But I can imagine wastewater reuse that you can tailor it for, if I want water for irrigation, or if I want water to recreation, if I want water for you know, augmenting some streams, like you know, streams that need to be more clean. Uh, uh, water for drinking water, and I'll talk about it later, or water for the ultra pure energy uh, industry, like electronics. So these require really unique technologies. And again, usually, I believe they'll be done with membranes, but currently the membranes, like the desalination membrane, they remove everything and let only water go, go through. Imagine if you can tailor a membrane and you find some way that you can selectively, if I want this kind of application, I will tailor it so it will have only this uh, water and some salt will go through and block all the others. And uh, if I want uh, another application, I will tailor it differently. And it's not easy. Again, for example, we can learn a lot from the mother nature. In, in our bodies, uh, we have biological channels. Like, let's say, for example, the potassium channel. It's a very sophisticated channel, protein channel, that was developed over an evolution of one billion years. And these protein channels can, I don't know if you, how much chemistry is out do you know, but if you can take sodium and potassium that look almost the same, this potassium channel can let 10,000 potassium ion go through and only one sodium will go through. So it means very, very selective. So if we can tail, tailor such membranes, we can really apply them to a wide range of application. Now I'm also a proponent that eventually we want to reuse wastewater for drinking water. Don't be in shock again. It's done many places in the world. And again, currently in Israel, you just do it for irrigation. But for example, in Orange County, California, they treat wastewater advanced by advanced technologies, not the one here, put it in the groundwater and then pump it for drinking water. So any one of you who was in uh, Disneyland, how many of you were in Disneyland? So if you drank a water from the fountain, probably some of the water molecules came from the treated wastewater. The city of Los Angeles now, they are going to convert their large wastewater treatment plant. They treat several hundred millions of gallons per day to convert it to a drinking water factory. And again, by very advanced technology. So we need to have really, really quite advanced technologies like the one that I mentioned, very smart membranes. And, and it's doable. Uh, now, why wastewater reuse? Again, it's consume much less energy than desalination. I mean, probably 30% of the energy. Also more environmentally friendly. Again, less energy, less CO2 emission. You don't put the brine in the ocean. So these are things that are quite advantageous. Now, the only problem is what we call the public perception or the yak factor. Y-U-C-K, yak factor. <laughs> so this is why I think engineers, and this is why I'm in favor, even in learning, like I discussed with Chaim, why it's the value of liberal arts education that you can work with social scientists and in, uh, in other humanities. And I think the only way to convince the public that you can drink this wastewater that came from your toilet is really to, through education and outreach and things that maybe engineers are not good at. So, so this is what I think the future, all this smart technology that can convert water of any quality to the quality, tailored quality that you need. And we are not there yet. And if you can do even 5% of what the biological channels of the membrane in our body doing it will be great. So I think this is the future, in my opinion. <laughs> so. Oh, well. And, yeah. Go ahead. No. <laughs> yeah, that that's, sounds fascinating. And actually, um, um, it, it's quite a challenge, I, I, I would say, because uh, always mimicking the natural uh, cells or whatever is is pretty uh, challenging. Yeah, but, but related to it, I heard that again with some environmentalists that are, they are concerned about the impact. Again, I'm, I'm doing research in desalination. I think it's appropriate to many places, but again, to have many, many, like five or six 
desalination along only 100 kilometers, I mean, you need to think about the environment. And now also what will happen with inland city like desert, again, they don't have the ocean, and, but there's plenty of wastewater. So again, you work on wastewater to recover nutrient and energy, but there's 99% of it is water. <laughs> so, so. so yeah, I, I would say that holistic approach is probably the uh, most yes, appropriate yeah. uh, way to tackle anything nowadays. And you also mentioned social and uh, engineering solutions. So it's all, I guess, connected together. Yeah, I think related to it because uh, just to, again, in Los Angeles, they go for wastewater reuse. They, some people try to push desalination, but there is a very strong environmental lo lobby and they just decided to go to wastewater reuse. Indeed, I heard from one of my students who is teaching at UCLA that, and again, he works on desalination, that if you just mention the word desalination in Los Angeles, you'll be canceled. <laughs> so they really want to go to waste. I think at least the leaders, I'm not sure about the people who live there. I mean, eventually I have to convince them, but this is the way they go nowadays. Okay, so um, maybe last but not least, <laughs> you know, uh, many of us, I would say, and many of our students uh, would really like to do a, a research which will make an impact, which will make a change. Being one of these people who managed to do that, um, the question is, what would you say to them? What would you, what would you say to us? <laughs> sure. So, how to be a good researcher? <laughs> anyway, I think, I think like anything, you need to have love and passion for it. You need to think about it all the time. Then. Many times, even nowadays, I mean, sometimes when I take a shower or run, or do, I think about research all the time. So you need to love it. Without loving it, I mean, you'll never be successful. You need to be curious. Again, it's science, again, and you need always to question why and why and why and why. Always can question. But Jews are very good in asking questions. So I think it's good. I mean, Israelis will have this. Uh, also, you need to work hard. Again, unfortunately, again, it's not eight to five job. I mean, if people are looking for eight to five job, don't be a scientist again. We work. Most of the time, so, so and some of you know about it. Uh, let's see, other things, some advice. Uh, you need to find a good mentor or, and or a good role model that you can emulate, again, especially when you're a young scientist. Sometimes a mentor, again, you are assigned to a certain professor and you are stuck with this professor, but again, you can always learn from others. Uh, also, you need to collaborate. Again, collaboration is very important. Again, when I was a young faculty, they told me it's not good to collaborate because you'll never get tenure, because you need to have all the paper by yourself. But nowadays, the situation is completely different. Again, you need to show some independence to some degree, but if you collaborate, you can have much more impact. Again, we always say in collaboration, one plus one is not two, is three, but I would say that one plus one is 11 if you collaborate, not even three. So, so these are things, and uh, let's see if I forgot any of these uh, magic things. Or to, oh, you need also to learn from fa failures again. People think that, you know, if you are in high school, you are the best high school student, never failed in anything. But as a researcher, you fail and fail and fail. Again, you do experiments. Probably, I mean, from the 10 experiments, only one of them will be successful. Many times, as a PhD student, you can work for three years just to develop the method. And only the last year, you get all the data for your dissertation. If you are a faculty, we know it. We submit papers. Not all of them accepted. We get, I don't know, whatever the success rate. And we need to have funding, research proposals to do our research. And if you have a success rate of 30% in funded proposal, you consider a genius. So we need to learn from failure and learn from failure. But again, these are all the things that what I see, if you it, everyone has their own philosophy. But I think the first one, the love and passion and work hard, I mean, there is no substitute for it. So, yeah. mm -hmm. So thanks a lot for sharing your time and your thought with us. And um, I'm, I'm sure that uh, the next generation will surely benefit from your thoughts and ideas. And it's not only the next generation. We all benefit right uh, today uh, from your um, thoughts and research. Amon, amon, toda. Thank you. Thank you so um, much.